And today it's Pole Vision. We welcome Juliana Stratton, Lieutenant Governor of Illinois. Welcome to Pole Vision. Thank you. I'm, I'm really grateful that you find time and, and to visit us here. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> what have the first two months of being Lieutenant Governor been like? Well, first of all, again, thank you for having me here today to share a little bit about what Governor Pritzker and I have been up to over the last couple of months and several weeks. Um, it's been exciting. You know, we both came into office with a real desire to serve the 13 million people of the state of Illinois, all of our communities, and making sure that we lift up communities, especially those that have often been ignored or forgotten. And so we hit the ground running um, and have already accomplished uh, quite a bit. We were able to, um, the governor signed the raising the, the law that raised the minimum wage uh, for 1.4 million America, uh, excuse me, 1.4 million Illinoisans all across our state. Um, we have established a new um, initiative, the Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative, which will be housed in my office. And so I'm ha so grateful to be able to take the lead on that. And we have just been hard at work making sure that we continue to travel the state and listen to uh, Illinoisans about the issues that concern them. During the campaign, you also travel a lot. You are very active. I remember you during the campaign. What did you learn about people of Illinois? Well, we have great people in Illinois. We have people all across our state that may come from different communities, some in the urban communities, some suburban communities, and some in rural communities. But overall, the people of Illinois are hardworking. They really want what's best for their families. They want strong communities. Um, and they really uh, have a lot of ideas of what we can do to really continue to move our state forward. And so one of the things that the governor and I have always tried to prioritize is making sure that we hear from communities directly. And that's why I was so excited that you invited me to be here today because um, we want to, of course, stay con con connected to the Polish community and make sure that we are hearing from the community around what things are important to that community. What new did you learn about Illinoisans? Well, what that we you never know before. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know what, for me, what was mm -hmm. interesting is that I am, uh, you know, I live on the south side of Chicago. And so I knew what my community was like and what Chicago was like, but we have a big, big state and it's very diverse. And so there are a lot of small towns that um, were just really, um, just quaint little towns that were really lovely. And then there were farming communities that I was able to go to. And so what I recognized, um, and as, as a state representative, what I always said was, it helped me to have a better sense of all the ways that we are both diverse, but also how similar we all are. And I don't think when you come from one particular community like I did on the south side of Chicago, you don't know how di diverse our, and different our communities are, but you also don't recognize how much we do have in common. What in your opinion is, is our state's biggest challenge? Well, of course, one of the state's biggest challenges is our uh, fiscal condition um, because of the budget impasse uh, during the last administration the first time that our state had ever gone without a budget and going 736 days without a budget that really caused a lot of devastation um, first of all it continued to cause our financial situation to become much worse because we had so many unpaid bills that really increased we had the interest on those late payments of bills. And then in our communities, we had so many um, uh, social service agencies and other agencies that were serving communities that weren't able to keep their doors open or had to lay off staff. And then we had our higher education system that also suffered under that impasse. So as you know, just um, over the last uh, several days, Governor Pritzker uh, presented his proposed budget, a balanced budget, uh, to help move our state forward. It is um, not a pretty picture. Uh, we always wish that we could do more, but we have to at least start doing something to help stabilize our state financially. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have, and it's why the governor and I have prioritized making sure that we get a budget propose a balanced budget and work with the legislators to get this budget passed so that we could begin putting our, our uh, state back on the right track. 
What is the new Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative? Um, well, it's as I mentioned, it's something I'm really excited about because it's housed in the office of the Lieutenant Governor. And it's, uh, it was formed from an executive order that Governor Pritzker signed a couple of weeks ago. And what it really does is it says that we should begin to think about um, the issues of our justice system, our criminal justice system, our juvenile justice system, but also just what's happening in communities all across our state where there might be higher rates of violence and other uh, ways that communities are not uh, safe. And it says, how can we look at those issues, not just from what's happening on the justice side, but how we look at issues from an equity standpoint and through an equity lens, and also think about opportunity. And one of the things that the governor and I have always prioritized is making sure that there are job opportunities for people all across our state, that we have educational opportunities for people so that young people can have a path to get a quality education, both early childhood education and K through 12. And for those who are interested to be able to have op options to go to college. We also want to expand vocational training because there are a lot of young people who would really benefit from a trade and getting a good skill that they can make a lot of, uh, have a great career with, um, but maybe college isn't their path. So when we think about justice, equity, and opportunity, it's really a way of saying, how do we tie all of these issues as we mm -hmm. think about the, the ways that many communities need to um, see a path to real opportunity and equity and, um, and just to really make sure that when we think think about the justice system, that we don't just think about incarceration, but we also think about what can be done in communities to help people uh, really have an, a chance to do better. Could you tell us a little more about the pillars of the initiative? I heard that there is a policing, sentencing, recidivism, and legalization of marijuana. Sure. So what we've really thought about is the fact that um, when we think about our criminal justice system, we should really think of it through a restorative justice lens. And what that means is when we think about our justice system, there's a lot of harm that has been done to some communities because of the rates of over-detention and over-incarceration. And what we really want to think about is what could happen in communities if we look at the root causes, what causes people to end up turning sometimes to crime or harming other people. What can we do in those communities to make sure that they have more opportunity and access to some of the things that we know help people keep people out of the justice system? Things like adequate housing, making sure that they have access to health care, including mental health treatment, making sure that they have access to quality education. These are things that can help people stay out of the system. So when we talk about these pillars, um, things like modernizing sentencing and making sure that there are not people who have excessive sentencing that doesn't match what the offense was. When we think about um, what we want to do to reduce recidivism, that speaks of helping people who come out of our criminal justice system to remove some of the barriers that keep them from reintegrating into their community successfully and making sure that they have access to opportunities so they don't just cycle in and out of that system. And then when we talk about, of course, um, something that the governor spoke of in his uh, budget address is that we are focused on um, legalizing adult use of cannabis. And the reason why this is something that's important is for several factors. One, it certainly is a, an additional source of revenue to our state by being able to tax the recreational use of cannabis. But the other thing that it does for our state is that it's a social justice issue. There are so many communities, especially communities of color, that have been disproportionately um, charged with and entering the criminal justice system for low level um, amounts of, of, of recreational, of cannabis. And so by legalizing the recreational use of cannabis and expunging many of those records, it will allow more people to, um, to be able to have the opportunity to take care of their families and to be able to uh, work and live in their communities and not be entangled in the criminal justice system. In addition, uh, this is an opportunity by expunging those records to make sure that people who have been harmed, communities that have been disproportionately harmed by the war on drugs, can have the opportunity to also be a part of this burgeoning uh, industry by making sure that they can be the workers and the licensees and the business owners in this um, adult use of cannabis industry. So this is a way of looking at the social justice aspect as well as the revenue generating aspect of uh, legalizing recreational I'm, cannabis. I'm really glad that you 
you are talking about restorative justice, because you probably know that um, Community Court of Cook County already ran this program, and there is one community court, and I know that they are planning to open more. And there were even plans to open a community court on the northwest side of mm -hmm. Chicago for people who have like small misdemeanors, but this, this is a challenge later in their life. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm a restorative justice practitioner, and um, all throughout my career, somehow, I've been doing some type of work in restorative justice. And restorative justice is not new. It is something that was that we take from indigenous people who recognize that when it comes to solving problems in a community, you don't have to go outside your community. If we think about our communities, we have everything that we need right in our communities to be able to think about creative ideas and solutions to help people. So when you talk about this restorative justice court that right now is in the North Lawndale community, the idea is that right, instead of going to the court system that's somewhere downtown Chicago, it's housed and based right in that community. So people who have been arrested, people who have been entangled in this justice system can find support systems and they can find solutions right in the community. And that's how I really try to lead the work that I do. And that's what I will lead with, with the Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative. How do we keep community at the center? Because it's so important. You are a lawyer. Your mother was an educator. Your father was a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. Why you choose politics? Well, I've just always been committed to public service. Um, I um, went to, uh, uh, I focused on being in a law firm for a couple of years out of law school, um, but I was trained as a mediator while I was in law school, so I did alternative dispute resolution. So I was always focused on how to bring people together, how to solve problems. And so I started my own practice, and I've been working in the field of public service throughout my whole career for over 20 plus years, not always as an, an elected official. My first uh, office that I ran for was for local school council at Kenwood Academy, which is a public high school that I attended and my daughters attended. And so I always wanted to help public education be a priority, and so I focused on that school. And then I ran for state representative, and now here I am as lieutenant governor. But all throughout, the focus has been how can we help make the lives of people better, whether it's in a school, or my district that I represented as a state representative, or now for the entire state. You are a very successful woman uh, who has already accomplished a lot. What advice would you give to your younger self? Well, I think the advice that I would give to my younger self is something that I talk with young people about all the time right now, and that is to be authentically you. Um, that's what I would have told my younger self, and that's what I tell young women and, and young people really today that there's a lot of pressure to try to become something that you're not. There's a lot of pressure in our world to think that if you want to be successful, you have to fit into a certain mold. But you are unique, and there's nobody else that can do what you do. And so I always try to say, be who you are, share the gifts that you have, and do the very best that you can, because we need your voice at the table, and no one else can tell your story like you do. True. Illinois politics is not an easy field. Mm -hmm. What makes women politicians successful? Well, I think one of the things that make women, uh, you know, women successful in the field of politics, but also in the field of business and so many other fields, is that we are very focused on making sure that we solve problems by communicating, by building the right relationships, and by working together to get things done. Um, you know, so you see women often saying, you know what, there's a solution to this. We juggle so much in our lives. Sometimes we juggle our families and children or caring for our elderly parents, or you know, we work in the community, we serve the community. So we know how to juggle a lot of things. And so we can bring all of those things together and then bring them and combine that with the fact that we love to problem solve and to work things through. We don't typically just say, you know what, I'm drawing a line in the sand and this is it. We're willing to say, you know what, the work has to get done, and we get it done. And there is more women in politics, and it's it's a good thing, in my opinion. Well, we're seeing more women run for elected office, and when women want, run, we often see them win. So it is a good thing, and, and it's good for our state to make sure that we have these diverse perspectives. There are women, that I had a woman ask one time, she said, I have a four-year-old, and I'm interested in running for office, but it's very difficult, and I'm not sure if I sh should do so, and I said, the best people to come up with policy about daycare and what working moms need to know about 
is a mom of a four-year-old. So we need more women running for office, and I hope those who are watching will consider it. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, too. What do you think about Chicago's mayoral candidates? Well, I'm really excited. I mean, we have, we're down to two candidates, and both of them are black women. And I think that's awesome to see the diversity and this history-making election. And so uh, the Governor Pritzker and I will work with whoever is elected, and we look forward to working with them to better our state. Do you have a favorite? I don't. I'm willing to work with whoever it is that's elected. Um, why, in your opinion, voter turnout uh, was low? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, throughout history, we are seeing that there's a need to be better civically engaged and help the public understand why voting is so important. I think sometimes when people, and young people in particular, don't think that their issues are being addressed or that they are being considered, um, that sometimes they think, well, my vote doesn't matter. But we have to get the message out that everyone's vote matters. Their vote is their voice, and we need to make sure that they get out to vote when, they are, that when there are elections. But I think we can do a better job, all of us who are in the field of government and politics, in making sure that we educate people about issues and why their voting can make a difference. At the same time, what I often say to um, people, and young people in particular, is they also have to hold us accountable. They have to be engaged, and they have to make sure that if they have issues or they have ideas or thoughts about what we can do better, that they can write their elected officials, they can write their representatives, they can call, go meet with their representatives, and for those who can, come to Springfield and see what we do firsthand. We work for the people. And so you all have the opportunity to hold us accountable. And so it's a two-way street. Civic engagement is a two-way street. But do you so think, think it's, a, it's a, a worrying issue that almost 70% of the people stay at home and do oh, not vote for the mayor? Yeah, I think it's always something that we need to do better. I mean, I think in every election, we want to see as many people as possible participating, getting registered to vote, making sure that they get out the vote. You know, there are a lot of places around our country no. where they're making it harder for people to vote. And voter suppression is real. So when you think about why would people want people to not vote, it's because we recognize, or they recognize, that voting is power. Of course. Making sure that you get the people who represent your interest in office is power. And so there are people who try to keep people from voting. So I just really want to recognize, and certainly from my community, and I recognized during the civil rights movement and how difficult it was um, to be able to have the right to vote, and we see this happening all across our country, voting is important, and it is a problem. Um, but what we can do is continue to talk about why it's important and make sure that in communities that people are encouraging others to each other to vote. Are there any uh, things you want to communicate to the Polish community? Well, absolutely. Again, I, I'm just grateful that I had the opportunity to share a little bit today about what Governor Pritzker and I are focused on. We want to represent every community, including the Polish community. And it just happens that I'm here today on Casimir Pulaski Day. Yeah. And I know I'm not sure when it will air, but whenever it airs, <laughs> it's it's awesome that I'm here on this day to, to really in honor of the contributions that he made uh, to our country, but also the contributions that are made every single day by Polish people people and Polish Americans to our state and to this city. So I just want to say that we look forward to working with you. We continue to learn more about your community and the issues that are important to you. We look forward to working alongside of you and are just grateful for all of the contributions that your community is making. Thank you so much, Juliana Stratton, Lieutenant Governor of the State of Illinois. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for you. visiting us in Polish. Thank you for having me.